Welcome to everybody who's joined. Looks like we've got a great crowd today. Um, so today I am grateful to Anthony Vaca. Um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I, I will let him give his own title because it changes every time I talk to him. But um, <laughs> Anthony leads the, uh, the inner source efforts at RBC um, and has been, has been working on inner source issues at RBC for uh, I think well over a year, um, which is I think more than most. Um, and so I asked Anthony to uh, give uh, give us some of his experience from from efforts to get an inner source program started within a financial institution, some of the lessons learned, et cetera. And he was gracious enough to agree. So Anthony, I will let you give a more complete introduction and take it away. Yes, thanks, Aaron, and thanks everyone for joining. So my name is Anthony Baca. Uh, I've been with RBC for 16 years, uh, and uh, over the last two years. Uh, along with, uh, with uh, the team that I work with, we've been on a mission to help change uh, the culture of uh, our company of, of RBC. And uh, yeah, it's, I, we eventually started up uh, the open source program office as well. But uh, before we could start our open source program office, our, our goal and mission, and we spent a year doing it together, was building up our inner source uh, program. So. Uh, a bit about uh, RBC, just for those that don't know, we're in Canada, uh, we're the cold, usually it's blue, I'd say in the pictures, because it's colder. They say uh, uh, it's a, last year we made about $13.8 billion in, in revenue. Uh, we are the largest uh, uh, bank in Canada, and I would say probably from a brand perspective, one of the bigger brands in, in, in Canada. Uh, we have five lines of business. Um, we're heavily uh, segregated at uh, Investor and Treasury Services, which operates all around the world. Uh, insurance, which primarily operates in Canada. Wealth Management, which is very large in uh, in the U.S., Canada, and in certain jurisdictions around the world. Our capital markets uh, business and our uh, personal personal commercial banking as well. Uh, Eighty four million. Uh, number of employees, 34 countries, 16 million clients globally. So uh, I would say that like other companies, uh, you know, we, we try to do a lot. We do a lot of uh, athletic sponsorships. We uh, sponsor golf. We do a lot of things. And the reason why I, I go through all of these things is because it really goes to show how much of a siloed organization that RBC is. And um, hopefully that resonates with a lot of people. Uh, being in a siloed organization gets really tough, especially when one person has a question on, on a team and they ask, you know, a senior person because they're new here. They ask a manager who's been here for like 16 years. The manager doesn't know a question. So the manager asks another peer that they worked with 10 years ago. That person is no longer technical. So they ask a person on their team who their lead is, who asks another person who knows the answer. But that answer is in a different org. So then that goes and you can see here, Information is really tribal. Uh, it's very siloed. And the worst part is, is when the second person has a question, the same question that does not get answered. Life is not the greatest for that person right at the bottom right hand corner. Now multiply this by the 84,000 people in RBC. Multiply that by the different jurisdictions, different time zones, different ways of communicating. It's very, very, very messy and very hard at times. Anthony, so, um, your slides are not up yet. Um, oh, we had taken them down. Ah, uh, sorry about that. Let me just share. I had a really cool thing with that. Sorry about that. So I'll just really quickly show. This is the silo piece where questions and answers come in. You multiply that by a large organization, and then it's Conway's law. So Conway's law is an organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So in simpler terms, it really is about um, the way your boss and boss and boss is organized. You're going to build your systems that same way, and there's going to be no cross-collaboration. So a lot of teams have done false starts to try to break those silos, and um, I wouldn't say that they've all been successful. I know at RBC, um, when how I got my job is uh, our senior executive uh, had asked a question on one of our um, collaboration tools called uh, Jive. And he asked the question, what are your pain points? Um, and a lot of them were around environment and uh, 
as well as you know open source community code sharing collaboration tools community uh, and a lot of those problems and pain points uh, bubbled up to him so he made the conscientious effort to say you know what I want to hire someone that can solve all these problems and that's how I got my job so I've been at the bank 16 years uh, 14 prior were in various different roles and then I got a like I got I'd say I got a cool lucky job. Uh, they hired me as a team of one, just myself, to help uh, solve this. And then um, I got lucky enough to start building a team uh, from the ground up of, of developers who were truly passionate uh, and 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 solving uh, cross collaboration. And eventually hired um, a couple developers, and we hired a community manager. Um, I'll throw names out. So Richard Gomez and Samuel Hack were two developers. Uh, community managers with Zelene Co and and Keisha Broadwin. So we had a lot of folks uh, join uh, the fight. And um, through that journey, uh, when I first started, I started on June 24th, 2018. That was my first day on the job. Um, first thing I did uh, about a month after was we went out drinking because um, I had no idea what how, how to build a community. So I was clueless. So um, I like to go for drinks and you can see here, this is a picture from the actual event where we went drinking and we just talked like, how do we solve, how do we solve all these silos? Like everyone's complaining that we don't have a community. Well, how do we do it? So our first drinking event, I, I blogged it on our internal site. I, I can't, I won't share that with you guys now, but if you guys really want to read that blog, yeah, just reach out to me. Uh, so we went drinking and, uh, nothing really happened. So, uh, we will, um, I eventually created a blog post on this in August, and I and I uh, I said the times they are changing. This blog post was really about um, how do we when I talk to people about this cultural change, how do we share more, how do we collaborate more? I got a lot of resistance, uh, saying Anthony, people have tried this many times, it's always failed. Um, so I wrote a blog post about all the top ten things that people said why this would fail and a uh, rebuttal against it. Um, so again, I was kind of at the drawing board. I had no idea what to do again. So I fall back on my common, um, crutch, which is let's go drinking again. So we went drinking two more times. Um, again, I blogged those events so people will be aware. I figure if people see enough free food and free drinks, uh, they'll, they'll join us. So, um, and then eventually decided that I should start rewarding the people that actually started showing up all the time and started sharing. So, um, with little handy things, uh, I made a um, a little a little award. We call it the Silo Buster Award. Basically, it's um, three trophies with a uh, a steel rod built through it with a star on it. It was uh, built in my little workshop here. Um, but now we give we built that award, and now we give it on a quarterly basis for people who share and and want to collaborate. Uh, it became a, a Kikichi thing, but now it's become every quarter we get a video. People get uh, actual monetary reward out of it. If it's, it's a team award, um, and it became a very popular thing. So I still didn't see enough uptick. Um, so we went drinking again, and I finally pleaded with people saying that I can't keep spending uh, the bank's money without seeing results. Uh, we really got to get serious about this. and. Um, so we stopped drinking at bars and we just got together at the office. This is obviously pre-COVID. And we uh, kind of started this little thing called DX Swarm. And uh, Swarm, I, I like bees. Uh, the team that, that started all this liked bees. So we kind of went with that theme. And the theme there was just get together. And um, I said, I will host the first event. And I will invite the people that I think are super cool and awesome. And I'll ask them to share their super cool and awesome things. And about, um, I think about like seven or eight people within the hour stood up and told their story of what people are sharing and what, what they could reuse. And that was a super cool event. As you can see, it was very well attended. And I told people that my, you know, I, I will, I'll host this one. But I have one rule if we continue to do this. The one rule is, is I can't host it again. Um, if I keep hosting the event, then basically I'm going to have all my friends always present and talk. And then I'm not going to learn. I'm kind of selfish. I want to learn from other people. So uh, the one rule we have is you can't host, you cannot host twice. 
and we've been having uh, we have six events a year. We do this every other month, and then we also have something called Tech Talks, where it's a uh, longer form and it's a deep dive, an hour. Uh, uh, it's usually like a half an hour to forty five minute deep talk with questions and answers on a various topics. So. Every month, there is guaranteed at least one event. Uh, there's several other small little events that, you know, in the question and answers, I can definitely talk about that. Um, and then uh, five months into the role, uh, we did all these things. And then I presented my boss saying, hey, thanks for hiring me and giving me a chance. Uh, uh, I'm a team of one right now. Um, can I uh, present to you how, how my strategy works and how we can take this forward? So what I'm going to the rest of the presentation is actually uh, a copy and paste of the strategy document that I gave to my boss uh, after trying all these things out and asking him basically for more money so I can hire people uh, and try to grow this out this initial source program. So this is the first slide I talked to my boss on. So I said after five months, you know, I presented this strategy. So I said I've done, I've spoken. Um, on inner source, like 20 different people and, and whatnot, from, you know, close friends and got some feedback. Uh, I've been using open source for the past 18 years at the time. Um, I didn't, I failed to mention, I, I, I had my own startup uh, back in the early 2000s where I built software and primarily my software was all based on open source. Uh, I use a lot of open source products. I built a product that uh, I basically built a CMS, like a WordPress before WordPress and all those other like like uh, SharePoint were, were available. And then I eventually sold that to uh, the Ontario uh, government, uh, but uh, it was primarily an open source and I was a big advocate of it. So um, I have some experience there. Uh, at the time, I was 15 years at RBC with 11 different jobs. So I've done everything from uh, development to quality assurance to project management to department manager. Um, it, I've done I've done a lot of different roles at RBC, so I kind of played many hats in this, and I kind of feel uh, how how others feel. So it was a great way for me to step in and walk in a mile in someone's shoes. Um, and and that was my job. So my job was inner source. So um, I actually got a lot of time thinking. Uh, on how to do this. I, I actually, at the time, went to Europe for, for two weeks. I did a backpacking trip and really did a lot of thinking on how how I would want to, what kind of company would I want to work for? And and that's what I try to model um, a lot of the, the actions that I do. Um, so, uh, and I had 30 minutes, so I presented him the strategy. So the two guiding principles that I, that I'd say are still the same today for our team is that principle number one, it has to be grassroots. Uh, this cannot be from the top of the house down. This has to be uh, a push from uh, the folks in, that they truly believe inner source is the culture that they want to work in. Uh, one of the biggest misnomers or misconceptions of inner source is it's a product or it's a, it's a thing I use. Inner source is a culture. And it's 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 something that is at the grassroots of the, the people on the hands-on keyboard they actually use. So um, when I talked to my boss, I told him, this has to be a cultural change. It's nothing more than a pro it's not a product. It's a cultural change. And it's, it's from the people up. And the second thing is is we have to build a community around this. And and obviously a community needs support. A community needs um, a community needs uh, sponsorship at the top of the house. It needs uh, funding to um, support the community, like the events that we do. Uh, they all had food. They had, a, you know, I think we had uh, like a vegetable tray with some cookies. So people came in and coffee. So people came in, they can, you know, have a quick bite. They can listen and they can learn. So it definitely needed a, a community vibe and a feel, but it had to be supported at the top. And I and I promise that if we can get that community and we do it grassroots, you let the people decide how they want to push and, and drive this change, this culture, then the byproducts would be things like reuse, cost avoidance, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I made it clear that this is, you cannot lead with these two things, these byproducts. We have to lead with grassroots and it has to be community-based. And then those things will come. It took about a good year to two years to actually get these byproducts. So it had, you know, my boss was patient with us. Uh, with the team, so uh, that that's definitely a, a great plus uh, support. So when I presented him, like 
how do we do this and, and promise him like a vision of, of reuse and collaboration and, and all these wonderful things. Uh, there's another while as a way I, I re- reread a book called um, Crossing the Chasm. Uh, so if you guys have read that book, yeah, you know, this will look familiar or any adoption curve, you'll know this is like a bell shaped curve where the first five phases, you first have people who are innovators, technology enthusiasts, the people that you don't even have to say a word and they're already doing the, this cultural change that I talk about that's inner source. The next is you have early adopters, people who uh, you have to spend about two seconds with them and then they'll get it. Um, these are people and employees that want the culture. They want to work like this. They want to change. I spent at the time 15 years. I you know now it's, it's you know, seven, 16, 17 years at RBC. I'm one of these people. I want to work in a place where if I have a problem, I can ask anyone and they'll help me. And if someone else has a problem, I will help them. It's just second nature to me. That that's that. These are the people that you want to target and uh, identify early on. Then in the book, it talks about this chasm. This chasm could take months to years to never happening. This is you can fall down this chasm and you can just your program can just die. Um, this is the chasm that is the hardest part to cross. Um, and once you cross that chasm, though. Then you can start looking and building your community with early majority, the pragmatic the people who um, basically want uh, convenience and they want to see things that just make sense in, to their job. They want to go nine to five and come home. And if it makes sense to them, they'll adopt. Then you have the late majority, the conservatives. These are the people, you know, I would say that are um, a little more the risk adverse. They, they kind of don't want to change um, if they don't have to. Then you have your laggards and skeptics. And if you group all of these people, these are employees that want solution and convenience. You're going to have a tougher time getting these people because you got to make life easy. You got to give them monetary reward. If, if the people on the left, you just have to like breathe and they're already following uh, the culture. These are the people where you got to, you know, you may have to pay them more. You have to, uh, put this in part of your uh, yearly goals. Uh, you have to chase them. You have to make it easier so they can go home earlier. That's a big difference. So when I joined, I would say in November 2018, we were definitely in this phase of of, uh, of our journey. And I'll, I'll show you at the end where and how we progressed. Because at the end of the slide, the presentation, I put a little bit of a uh, a summary of, of of our journey. So I told my boss that. Uh, when it comes to employee experience, uh, and you can read, I, I can't uh, remember the book that I got this from, but uh, uh, with any cultural change, there's three parts to it. There's culture, there's technology in a workplace. So I broke the problem down into these three segments on how to build that inner source culture. So um, I took them through my plan on how we do all three. So culture, um, from talking to friends, talking to previous colleagues, um, talking to my boss and his peers, we crowdsourced this um, this definition of what we want InterSource to be at RBC. Now, at your companies, it may be different. Uh, it may be the same, who knows? But um, it was a culture. We wanted a collaboration. We wanted a culture that communicates openly about the challenges and ideas. We want a culture where the community is energized by the challenges. We want a can-do culture that is willing to give instead of take. We want a culture that is willing to admit that it's not perfect. And we wanted a culture that is looking to grow and improve. Now, at our first big, big event, I presented this to uh, all the people that attended. You can saw, you saw there was over 150 people there. I got in trouble for the fire code for the record, but that was a goal of my, my boss and I had was to get in trouble. I presented this and then someone came to me and said, Anthony, this looks like shit. I'm like, okay, make, make it better. Like, this is the whole point of a community. So the designer came in and actually uh, redid this whole slide to make it look like this. And that's where I got super excited. I'm like, wow, we had this cool thing. And this person, a designer came in and just made it look better. And that, if I can say, has been the whole theme of our inner source program at RBC. We've really started with something that was crap. And we've just been building, building, building on top of each other's ideas. And if you actually look at the previous one, um, how this looked, we actually also changed the words. So this actually always has been evolving and I've gone to the same designer or they've actually shared the content. We've actually updated the, the 
the content as we evolve. So then uh, when it came to culture, uh, there's a famous quote, you can never improve if you can't measure. So we really want to focus on measuring our um, our productivity. But the problem is, is that I had I was by myself. I had a, a, a co-op student uh, that was working with me one day a week at the time who wasn't focused on this. So I was pretty much uh, flying solo. So what I did was um, I told my boss, listen, we have all these events here. Look, look how many people are in there. I can't tell you uh, through statistics, you know, how many people there are there. I can't tell you who's winning the awards and how we recognize and sharing. But if you give me some time, I will actually um, start trying to show you measurements. So I showed him this chart. I said, wouldn't this be cool if I can tell you how many people are reusing libraries? Or you know, this is all fake data, by the way. This is not real at all. I made it all up. Um, wouldn't it be cool if I can do this? If I can do that? I showed him. I showed him um, some cool stuff, and then I then he's like, Anthony, this is awesome. I want this. So he actually let me hire one person. So his name is Richard. Um, he was my co-op student for. Uh, he worked with me one day a week, and um, he came in starting in January of 2019, and uh, he created some dashboards for us. So we were able to start measuring. Um, uh, who's actually uh, uh, contributing to uh, different projects. And these are a bunch of projects that we have. Uh, I can show you live stuff later on if the questions go there. Um, we, we started seeing like who's collaborating on what. So Richard did a great job to actually put that, you know, for that vision of like my crappy little PowerPoint enticement to actual like real data that we were tracking. So then we, I talked. I walked him through um, some workplace uh, changes. So I told him, like, we really need to start building that culture around. Um, oops, there it is. So we need to build that culture where people can work anywhere. So we actually started doing some more events. So we did a lot of like office hours. We've done. Uh, we did a, a kids code camp. Uh, we do. Uh, we eventually hired someone to help out with that, uh, giving back to the community. As you can see, the bottom part. We, we did more awards. Uh, we have small little lunch and learn sessions. We really started giving people the place to work and, and the time to work. So that was super important um, as well. So I actually, uh, before COVID, uh, getting space to work at in, in our company was very difficult. Um, you have to book a year in advance to get a space just like this. So we actually got priority on a lot of things, which is really helpful. Uh, finally, technology. So we needed the right tools to do things. Um, uh, I, this is a, this is not an endorsement of tools. Uh, this is just tools that um, we've used. Um, I, I, I don't want to. I'm not going to endorse anything that uh, that just making sure I don't get in trouble with uh, any companies or anything like that. So we we focused on GitHub. I'd say uh, that's been uh, the number one tool that we started adopting right off the bat. Um, Back in, so like I said, I've been here for since like the early, the mid 2000s. Um, since then, when I joined, we had probably five, six, seven different soft uh, SCM tools. Uh, soft, uh, so uh, I'm not going to, you know, Harvest, S Subversion, um, so many different tools. Uh, and in 2015, 16, 17, there was a conscious effort to, consolidate all those SCMs into one tool, which is GitHub. And that has been, I'd say, uh, the, the ground, that, that's like, you don't, you don't have GitHub installed or a tool like GitHub where you can consolidate all your source code into one spot, then like that's step one. You, you're, you can't collaborate on code if everyone's storing the code in different repositories. So the table stakes right off the bat is you need um, a one place to work in. I, I personally like GitHub. I know that's kind of like an endorsement, but uh, it's my, my tool preference. Uh, I think that you could do it with other tools. I think GitHub just lends itself to be like the, the, the more superior tool just where they are in the marketplace. Um, again, uh, if, if you, everyone's sharing their code in one spot like GitHub, uh, communication was just everywhere. There's so many ways to communicate. Email is not very conducive to uh, talking live. Um, I would say, again, like I said, it's not an endorsement. This is what I like because I'm used to it. I'm, I'm a creature of habit. Um, I like Slack. I used it before uh, RBC uh, and adopted it. 
but we adopted it uh, wholly and I was happy to see it. Uh, I'm used to it. And uh, it really became a bridge between different organizations and uh, our developer community really rallied around it and a lot of conversations happened there. Um, it, I would say it's very easy for me to say, hey everyone, I'm gonna be presenting five cool topics. I make an announcement and boom, I get people joining me uh, in the conversation. So it's been a really easy way if you can manage to get everyone collaborating and talk, talking on like a real-time chat system like Slack, it's going to make your life a lot easier. Next, um, as good as Slack is, we wanted to uh, really try to mine the data that comes out of Slack. So we actually created a, an internal Stack Overflow. Uh, we, we built this uh, in-house um, based on a couple open source projects. We put it together. We actually started putting in very important information in, in null pointer. Um, it's our internal stack overflow. We, we've tried to put uh, relevant information. So when developers get stuck on something, instead of waiting you know, 24 hours for a reply, you can search this uh, this repository for any useful information. And that, that hopefully that helps people um, resolve their problems. Another internal tool that was created was a learning lab. It's like GitLabs. Uh, basically, uh, I mentioned earlier about tribal knowledge. Uh, it, and then and the culture of giving instead of taking. Learning Labs is exactly that. People have started to actually put uh, learning materials on uh, in, a, in a very organized manner into specific labs with specific themes uh, that are very hard. Like, how do I use Vault at RBC? How do I use our OpenShift environment at RBC? Oh, at RBC? How do I use, you know, any, uh, how do I do machine learning at RBC? Uh, we put it together, all these learning opportunities for unlocking RBC specific tribal knowledge. And finally, um, we needed a place to put all of our artifacts. So uh, we used uh, Sonotypes tool. Um, it's a, you know, Nexus is open, uh, Nexus repository is open source. Um, and Nexus IQ, another tool you can use for scanning. Uh, those are the, the key tools um, that we eventually put up. I wouldn't say day one, we needed all of these. Uh, I kind of walked you guys through the progression of where we focused our efforts on. Uh, and there's more tools to come. Again, I can ask if there's questions in the end, I can always answer those then. So uh, I'll kind of wrap up. And this slide was uh, um, a little summary slide of, two, of, the, of our first year. So um, at the end of the first year, from zero, because we never measured uh, active projects, we had about 70 active projects in our first year, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, I tell you now, uh, when we first started an org in Intersource in our GitHub repository, we had like nothing. It was like <laughs> we started from scratch, ground up. So to get seventy projects doesn't look like a large number, but that was pretty active in in, seven, in, in thirty days. That's pretty good. We had a hundred plus contributors that are very active, which was hey, we got people. Like I remember my boss saying, "What's the number today?" Uh, you know, we were, we had ten people being active. And you know, 20 people, 30 people. When we got to 100. It's like, wow, we got 100 people actively working here. That was a, you know, that was a, it's a small number, but it, it was very, very from zero to 100 is, is pretty, uh, you know, exciting. Uh, in the year, we did about 25 events to really rally the community. Uh, we had one community award, and if you look at the whole entire year, the amount of unique people we landed on 297 unique people. And that's about one third were active. So about 300 people and about a third of them were active uh, every 30 days. And again, so, you know, I, I would work for a couple of days on a project and that's an inner source. Then I would, you know, finish it. Then I would bring it into my other project and then I would actually use it internally on my other application. And then I would not be active for a couple of days. So we're totally not expecting all 300 people to be active 365 days of the year. This is really like when you only go in when you need it. So um, this is a new slide that I did just the other day, uh, just as a little update uh, for 2020. So that was, that was year one. This is year two. Year two active projects uh, in the last 30 days when I did this, these metrics, we're at 313 projects. So you can see here we, we did a very, fairly big jump. Um, active contributors uh, it went from 100 to about 140. Uh, so again, a good uptick. Uh, we again, we have well, we, there's only 12 months a year, uh, so we still are doing the same amount of events that hasn't changed. Uh, we have one community award, 
Uh, so that hasn't changed. And by the way, the community, the community of and sharing events, they've all gone uh, virtual now. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, I was, uh, our community manager, Elaine and Keisha, they didn't miss a beat. They, they, they adapted very quickly and we shifted uh, virtually very quickly. And I would say uh, we actually have more people attending. I'm not sure if it's the reason, but we have more people attending virtually than we did physically in the past. I'm not sure if it's because we're becoming more popular or if it's just easier. I have no idea why, but um, we're actually we, our events are being more uh, more uh, more attended, which is great. And finally, uh, unique contributors. Uh, the year is not over. Our year our year end is uh, October 31st. So we have one more month, but uh, right now we're at five uh, 456 uh, unique people in our uh, in our Tino org. Um, the cool thing here that I didn't mention um, is this is just our technology department. Uh, if you look at, and, and these are the goals that I put for uh, my CTO, but this number is actually about uh, 670 if you look at uh, outside of our TNO org. So the contribution is actually a lot higher if you look at outside of our, of our org. I should have updated that number. Sorry for the confusion. So. If I look at this adoption curve, uh, same thing. Uh, if I said, you know, 2018, we're here. Um, 2019, I would say we were still trying to get those enthusiasts and getting people excited. Uh, and trying to, you know, 84,000 employees, it's very hard to find uh, those hidden gems. Uh, 2020, by the end of this year, I'm hoping we have a, a good early adopters. We have, we know kind of what we're doing now. 2021, I'm hoping we can try to be you know, trying to cross that chasm where we've made life easy for developers to reuse, to collaborate, and we can then really focus over the next few years to really get the early majority. This is going to be the hard part because people are, are going to complain, oh, this is not working, this is not easy. So there's going to be a lot of work to really get those early majority. I don't plan to get the late majority. This is going to be a, a even a harder uh, task. Um, but yeah, I would say the hardest part is you know, crossing that chasm. Um, so, uh, I'd like to share a bit about the, the long-term vision of where we want to go. So, uh, it was a, it's a four-horizon approach. I, I took inspiration from the Linux Foundation. Um, they have a four-horizon approach, but it's a little different. I tweaked it. Um, for me, to, it, it's step one. It's your base. It's uh, you can't start. You don't start anywhere. You need that inner source culture. You have to get people rallied, working together, and that's horizon. That's horizon zero. Horizon one is eventually we'd like to start managing our open source supply chain. A lot of our inner source projects um, have come from open source and we bring it in and then we reuse across the organization. So uh, examples are, you know, people are downloading Angular. I tell them, go, great, you're reusing, perfect. Uh, there's another team that has downloaded Angular, but they put all the RBC style guidelines. They put accessibility use cases. They put all the, 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 the color RBC's blue is blue. We're very particular about that blue. It's a royal blue. So please make sure you use that. We, we're very particular about like your branding team, the logo you use. So I tell people, you can download Angular, sure, um, or you can download uh, our, our version of Angular. We put an inner source. The one in inner source has all this work done. You can go download the Angular version, the open source one, but make sure you do all that work. Either or pick one. I personally think the one that's the inner source has saved you a lot of time. And we've seen with that little kind of you know mental map, people are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Let's move, let's move over here because inner source has the enterprise standards. Um, so what we want to do is we want to manage that supply chain. So all the open source that comes in, we want to make sure A that uh, it's been scanned and we try to resolve as many vulnerabilities as possible, as well as we want to be respectful to use the licenses as the author deems as they put in there. If there's uh, uh, requirements, and Aaron's gonna love this, if there's requirements that you need to attribute, we attribute. If there's requirements that we need to provide the source uh, upstream, we provide that source. So that's our first horizon. Uh, that's what we're working on right now. Horizon two is we wanna eventually start contributing mindfully. Uh, this is the point where we wanna be able to uh, find a vulnerability, fix it, and then contribute it back. So that way we are in line, lock, lock and step with the open source project. So if there is an enhancement or another vulnerability that's fixed, we will be able to quickly upgrade and move that over into our, into our organization. 
And finally, uh, Horizon 3 is we want to be able to lead strategically. We want to give back to the community some very good projects. Uh, my my one, one that I want to give back is the Null Pointer application. Love to give that one back. Uh, the, the Learning Labs is also a great one to give back. We have a lot of custom tools that we've built that we, I would love to give back. But to me, we need to master um, Horizon 1, 2, and 3 before we can do that. So uh, just wrapping up, uh, I would say the key takeaways in establishing that culture is you need a small team. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big team. Uh, our team is very small uh, between uh, Richard, uh, Samuel, Elaine, Keisha, uh, we're, a new person's joining, uh, Sal. We've gone people that have dedicated their time. This is a person named Kirk. Uh, all these people are joining this cause because they want to get involved and start changing the culture. So start building that team, rally around a small group of people, and it really empower them. They need leadership uh, support at the top to make that happen. Second is, I'd say, make it uh, invite only at first. So if you're trying to kick this thing off, uh, we did a lot of invite only, you have to know. So those drinking events, um, if you know someone who knows someone, sure, come along. But we didn't really advertise them well. We said, hey, we're going drinking, we're gonna talk about cool, we're gonna geek out on tech stuff, come along. Uh, we really made it like, you gotta know uh, on the inside to actually attend these events. Um, I remember Richard, the first uh, who I eventually hired, I remember um, talking to him, and he's and I and and I remember asking. He's asking. I heard there's an event today. I'm like, yeah, come along. Here's the, the details, and he came along to the event. So really make it uh, uh, exclusive at first. Uh, it really makes it a club, and then it'll eventually grow. And people will just start like pounding into and wanting to get involved. Uh, the second, uh, the third is is make uh, discoverability easy. Um, GitHub is great because the search is is fantastic. It's fast. Um, we're, we're, we're always investing in the search, uh, pieces of it. Uh, love to come back and, and, and if Aaron will have me to talk more about this in the future, but we're doing more things around search to make search easy. So people can just find the, the projects they want to collaborate on. They could find the projects that they could reuse. Next is I would say community. Community is one of the most important pieces. Have those events, uh, we have our culture. We, we we remind ourselves at least once every month on those six uh, those six key topics. At least for within our own team. Um, my favorite being is we're really too willing to give instead of take. We this little team that we have, we are the models. Uh, we have to uh, lead by example. So we're we're all about community on, on our team. And finally, I think the most important is uh, it's a lot of work. So you got to move the dial every single day you're going into the office you know we think about this every single day we're trying to do little things every single day to make a big impact um so with that uh, i'll uh, thank you for listening and i'll take any questions thank you so much anthony um i will get started with the first question so um you uh you talked about the sort of number of active projects active contributors um how are you measuring what active is from an inner source perspective. I assume it's not just that the people who started the repository are active in it. What does it, what does it mean to be active? So to be active means uh, in GitHub, they have made a commit to a piece of code. They have either maybe changed the readme to find a spelling mistake and they fix that. It is, they created, they found a bug and they created an issue. So any th activity on GitHub, is active and 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 people may say, oh, oh, they're they're creating an issue. That's not really important. That you shouldn't count that. I'd say that's probably more important because uh, testing is such an important part. And if someone can test an application, then create the issue and notify us or notify that developer, then that developer now has saved time in testing his application. They found that that edge case, and they can then fix it later on. So any piece of uh, contribution is uh, what we count as active. Great, thank you. What um, what does it take to um, like? How how does a repository become an? Does somebody say I want to make my project an inner source project within RBC, and then you know other people can find it that way? Like, what's what's the difference between just a software project and an inner source project? Yeah, so a great question. So I'm gonna I'll just show you guys this one. Um, so uh, right now, this is our um, inner source project. You guys see my screen. So we have an overview here. 
in the overview, you create an issue. Um, and I create a new issue. And I can either move a repository from a, a pub, from a private place where no one knew what it was. We get a lot of these. Or I can create a brand new project. You click on one of these to get started. Um, we fill out a little form. Tell me the name. Tell me the maintainers. Tell me the purpose. Then we'll have a little conversation. Hey, this project's already duplicated. There's something very similar to this. Why don't you try working with those people? Uh, or, hey, this is a great idea. Um, I, and I'll create them the project. So we actually have a little bit of a quote unquote management of it just so that we can. Um, we found that um, people just created a project before searching to see if someone else already had done it. So we try to really promote people to search before they just create. Got it. So if I have something that uh, that I'm working on currently, but it's not in the inner source space, um, I can I can ask to move that repository over, and then it becomes visible to others who who go there. Exactly. So our our the way we've structured it is we have inner source commons as an org. Great. Um, okay. It looks like we have a question from Junji. Junji, do you want to just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask? Oh, sure. Yeah, so my question is, we are also trying to focus uh, our initial efforts in our open source program office, uh, trying to establish the, uh, an, an inner source culture, right? Uh, but there are already many teams that are contributing to existing projects on an individual basis from their own accounts outside of work hours. And there are some teams that want to open source their code. And we are trying to manage all that, the expectation of different uh, teams while trying to establish an inner source program. How did that journey um, uh, go for uh, for your company? Uh, did you uh, push or uh, did you not get involved with any of contribution uh, or you try to manage like a case by case uh, or you establish the minimum like a uh, framework in order to contribute while establishing an inner source program first? So um, I don't want to say we ignored, but I would say I ignore any people that try to make contributions. Uh, we still have people that make contributions that are not part of inner source. Um, that wasn't, our, that was not our goal at the time. Uh, our goal was to find um, projects that are, highly uh, collaborative. For example, the Angular example that I gave you or another great one is security. Um, so what we did was we tried to make, we tried to download open source projects or create projects ourselves that would make life easier for developers. So the best example I would say, like our first big successful project was security. No one likes to do security uh, as a developer uh, or I say very few, they want to just make it work. Because uh, it's, it's usually hard and very very cumbersome, and, and and people don't even know where to start. So the first pro the first successful project, and 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 Richard who joined our team, um, this was his project was we created a a Java um, security uh, single sign on uh, module. Another person created one for Node. Richard on my team, I'm like, hey, we're not even using Python, but just create a Python one because it sounds like people are excited about that. So we created a lot of security. Um, how to's and, and people collaborated on those ones. Uh, we ignored all the other ones that are, you know, people are making contributions outside. I wouldn't focus on that because our mission was how do we get people to reuse things internally? As you mature, we're going to be eventually tackling those other ones, but we didn't want to get, we didn't want to try to solve all the problems at once. We focused just on let's build something that's reusable across the bank. Other questions for Anthony? I have a, a question. Um, so we've been looking at um, trying to do inner source and encourage people to do it, but some of the concern is um, just uh, like administrative like time management and, and uh, making it an initiative for um, like the managers and directors to allow their team to work on stuff that's collaborative that's not necessarily direct to their project, um, even though you know working on the security eventually helps their project if they're using that, but sometimes that's like their free time that they want to work on. Um, is there any way that you've addressed uh, this kind of administrative side of encouraging people to do it? Yeah, that's uh, so I, I alluded to the um, the times there. I'm a, I'm a I like music, um, so 
I, I wrote an article just on that topic alone, and because um, I got I got tired of always answering that same question. Oh, was, I I don't got time. Uh, the way the first thing I did to address it, <clears throat> excuse me, was uh, I wrote I wrote I got <clears throat> sorry, I just want to take a sip of water. Uh, the first thing I did was I, I wrote an article about it and addressing it, and I said there's in the long run you're going to save time. And a hundred percent, I agree that the first co contributions are going to waste your time. I'm not going to argue that. Um, and any other subsequent commits, they are for sure going to uh, take time and you're not going to reap the benefits. But six months from now, when there's an, uh, an enhancement that someone else needs and they upgrade your library to the newest, you know, Olaf version, you're not going to have to do that because someone else will need that. And I gave an example, and uh, the example was, uh, uh, MITRE, uh, if you look at MITRE ID Connect, it's an OAuth uh, library. Uh, one person who built it had an upgrade. There was an upgrade, and, uh, and the second person wanted to use it. His name was Hussein. I got, got him to speak in front of uh, a large audience, and I said, listen, Hussein, tell him the story. So Hussein basically downloaded this OAuth product. He used it. Uh, it there was an upgrade. Uh, it broke his application. He fixed it. Everyone else uh, got the updates, and they eventually avoided an outage. So in the beginning, I had to tell that story. That was my main story that I told every 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 week. I told that story at least three times. Um, and after telling that story over and over again, uh, I didn't have to tell. A, I haven't told that story probably in the in the year and a half. So you got to find a story that is like that. And, and get those people to speak up. And I actually had the, I, I can bring it up. I had the commit that, that, that Hussein did. And I said, this is the commit that he did that saved, um, that saved everyone else time. <clears throat> and you just find that good story and, and repeat that story as many times as you can. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. It looks like we've got a question from Richard. Richard, do you want to ask it yourself? Any secret source method tips in identifying potential advocates, influencers of open source within an organization? Um, so I would say sl sl for, for us, because we didn't have metrics in the early days, I would say Slack was the secret sauce and, and for us um, because you can see who's talking on, on Slack, you can see and you can talk to people. And um, I was, because I, I was very familiar with Slack and before joining this group, uh, I was very comfortable with it. So um, that to me in the beginning, when you're first starting out, uh, you don't have everything at your disposal. Slack was for me, the secret sauce. Um, and if you guys Google, I did this talk, the talk that I just did for you about a year ago. And I did it in conjunction with Slack because Slack was such an important part of this project, uh, of, of this journey for us. Um, now that we have Slack, uh, so now that we have our, our, our GitHub is is vibrant and, and working really, really well, I would say now it's, uh, I just go on GitHub, look at the metrics that that, my, that the team uh, that produces, and I can see everyone who's contributing like like instantly. But before, I, I did, before we didn't even have that, the secret sauce was uh, Slack. And then I see another question from Alex. Great presentation. Thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you. Given your uh, reliance on open source, would love to hear a bit about your thoughts related to development and management of your software bill of materials. Where is your focus today? If you can share, and where do you plan on expanding the process going forward? So um, the last uh, item that I shared on the tools we use was uh, Nexus and Sonatype. So the Sonatype suite of tools. That's been our focus um, in 2020, and uh, I can see us, we're going to be doubling down. So we have one person working on that, Richard Gomez on our team. He's been focusing on that, um, a bit of, you know, supplementary side. Other folks have been helping out. But in 2021, we're going to be doubling down like and get getting some more help on that. Like, that, I, I can see that managing our bill of materials is going to be crucial uh, for us. Now that we have our culture like established and obviously we got to keep supporting and we cannot um, shy away of supporting the community. Uh, 
but now that our team has grown, we're going to put more effort on 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 Nexus, uh, and or you may use our factory or whatever tool you use. But that's where our, our focus is going to be. Um, we're, we're partnering with our legal department and our and our cyber department, so they are, are stakeholders in building this this uh, this capability across the organization as well. And I can probably come back in in a, in a few months and talk about how and share how that's going, how, how our Horizon One is going. Great, thank you. And I think that our own James McLeod has a question. Hi, Anthony. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, yeah, so I had a question about how Inner Source within RBC actually works. So, are you a centralized team, you know, who looks after and maintains all of the Inner Source projects on behalf of RBC? Um, or do you allow developers to have their own GitHub profile and then, you know, fork the repositories, um, take them into their projects? and then contribute any fixes they may find into the upstream repository. So really so, it's about, you know, do, do engineers have control over those projects or if they need anything fixed, do they then raise an issue, you know, back to the yeah. source team? So in the beginning, uh, where no one was collaborating, um, our, I would say our, um, our visionaries, our, our, our tech enthusiasts, uh, I'll show, give a shout out to like Aaron Clark, Matthew Clark, uh, though, like those types of people at RBC, those folks uh, did not work for me directly. Um, they were uh, just developers, and they had full control. Um, our team with Richard and myself, we would put stuff into InnerSource, and we'd have control over those ones. But InnerSource is completely um, uh, uh, distributed. Everyone manages their own repositories 100%. Um, we, I would say now that it's grown, we've managed less and less projects. We have our own projects that we've always maintained, but we are a small team. And I kind of like it that way that by design, we're very small because if someone comes to me and says, hey, Anthony, can you fix this project or this issue? I'm like, we're small. We can't fix every project. There's over 300 projects. So it's kind of good that we're small because we can use that excuse. Uh, what we do do is we do now give more consulting services. And for the very, very mature projects, uh, we don't. We actually don't want them to fork the projects. We actually want them to um, create, uh, you know, a build materials. We want them to create an artifact, store it in Nexus, and have them download it through uh, through the artifact management uh, framework that we built out. So that we do more of that consulting now than anything. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Great. Thanks for the question. Well, okay. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, I think your experience um, and all the work you've done on this is going to be immensely helpful to the others in our community who are getting started on their inner source programs. So it's really, really helpful to have you share today. Um, and yes, we would love to have you back to talk about search and discoverability um, uh, once you're a little further down that road. So thank you for offering. Um, Great. Thank you so, for listening. Great. Um, all right, everyone, um, we'll be back in two weeks for the next installment of Open Source Readiness. Thanks so much for joining today. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody.